Okay, thank you. Can I, if I speak like this without the, you can hear me, can't you? Yeah? Brilliant. Okay. Um, Itesh, thank you, Itesh. Thank you, Joe. Um, Itesh, talking about the fire there, just reminds me, um, I mean, if there is a fire, it isn't something that we've programmed into the event as a sort of dramatic experience for you. Um, I mean, I do say that because the first time I ran a drama workshop for teachers, um, somebody actually fell over and injured themselves, and we actually had to get an ambulance, and this was the first activity that had happened during the day. And um, it was quite strange. Somebody arrived late for the session, and they came in and there were sort of ambulance men around and somebody was lying on the floor and we were sort of comforting this person and they came in and they said, wow, what amazing drama you've managed to create. Um, so, you know, hopefully there will, no, will, there will be no events like that today happening. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that um, I, I disagree in a way with the, the title of my talk, which... Um, which I guess is unfortunate, because I'm actually the person who wrote the title of my talk, but I, I disagree with it because um, I think we all know, and we're probably all here, because we believe that drama, in all its many forms, is a very powerful tool for the language teacher. Um, I mean, I have, very, I have first-hand experience of that, as Joe said, um, as a second language learner of Danish, um, I would probably say that going to drama college in Denmark was the second best thing I could do in order to improve my Danish. Um, you know, it was a fantastic, it was a fantastic experience. The first, obviously the first, the best thing I did to improve my Danish was, was having a Danish girlfriend. That was definitely <laughs> the best, the best uh, thing I could do. But, um, so, you know, we, we believe in, in, in drama and that's probably why we're here. Um, also, as a teacher, it's one of the things that I've done when I've got students to put on plays, when I've incorporated drama techniques into my teaching, it's one of those moments when you think, yes, this works, this actually works. I can feel that there is something happening here. People are learning something. People are very motivated by this, and it's a very powerful tool. But I disagree with that, um, in that... I mean, when Hamlet said these lines, I'll have grounds more relative than this, the place, the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king, he saw the play as a solution to his problem, to, uh, well, as the solution to his problem of uh, finding out whether um, his uncle murdered his father. Now, I would, so I would not say that that um, putting on a play with your students is the solution. It is, it is, so perhaps the title of the talk should be rather, um, a play is a thing. It doesn't quite have the same ring to it. Um, I, as far as I know, Shakespeare didn't use that line in any of his plays. But, so, um, you know, in the course of the day, you will experience um, a wide, wide range of different drama techniques. Um, and many of those techniques um, are things that may be part of a um, project to put on a play, but they're also things that can stand completely independently. This play, Hamlet, was produced, sorry, um, published in 1603. 17 years before that, there was another writer who was also trying to reproduce authentic dialogue of the time and trying to write motivating material. Um, he was doing it for very, very different purposes though, not for entertainment, but rather for educational purposes. And I'd like to show you a very short extract from that book. The book was written by a Frenchman called Jacques Bellot, and it was published in 1586. And here's a, a very short extract from the book. Um, it was one of the earliest examples, hi, one of the earliest examples of a course book for teaching English. And it was written to teach English to the growing population of refugees, Huguenot refugees who were arriving from France. <coughs> 
So it was an ESOL course book in 1586. And it consisted almost entirely of dialogues. So as you can see here, on the left-hand side, you've got the English dialogue there. And this is, this is more or less how the book begins. It's first thing in the morning. So Barbara says, the mother says, rise quickly. It is time to go to school. Your maester will jerk you if you cannot, lay, if you cannot say your lessons. And her son, Peter, replies, our maester hath no rods. <laughs> and Barbara, his mother, then replies, I will carry him some. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, because this is a, a language teaching book, uh, in the middle there, we've got a translation of this for French speakers, so they know exactly what it means. And we've also got a pronunciation guide running down the for, for, for French speakers so they know how to, to say the lines. Now, we don't know exactly how this material was used, but we can assume that um, it would be uh, practiced by language learners, um, perhaps it might be memorized by language learners, and perhaps it might be performed. So the idea of using a play um, as a tool for language teaching is not a new idea, it's been around a long time. In fact, I mean, um, some, in, in 25 centuries of language teaching, um, it's been suggested it's been, that plays have been used since way before this time. Um, now, I wanted to, to work a little bit with an example from this text, because in many ways, when we work with a dialogue or a sketch or a play with students, and it's not their first language, they are encountering the text in a way that you might, in a similar way to the way that you're encountering this text. So um, I'd like us to, to sort of, this is a drama day, so I'd like us to sort of engage a little bit with a little bit of drama. And I'd like you to go back in time a little bit to Elizabethan England in London. And um, I'd like to, you to find yourselves in a butcher's shop. Okay, well, as a vegetarian in a butcher's shop in a visit in England. Okay, um, could you just engage with the person next to you and just decide um, which one of you is going to be the person who's buying something in the butcher's shop and which one of you is going to be the uh, butcher? Just decide that, just quickly. You don't need to say anything. Okay? Okay, great. Now, um, you, could, you could be three. When Mario Benvenuti does this technique, it always works, but it never works for me. So you put your hand up if we, if we could just uh, um, stop what we're doing. Um, right, now, so what I'd like you to do is to have that conversation but I'd like you to do it without any speaking. And presumably, none of you are, are proficient in Elizabethan English. So I'd like you to do it through mine, if you can. Could you just try and have that conversation without any speaking, just using mine and gestures? Okay, just for a couple of minutes, okay? Okay, love it. I would, I would actually love to just leave that happening for an hour or something. But uh, um, unfortunately, we can't. Um, could you, could you just, keep, um, just, just have a chat about what you've been doing? What, do you, what, what was the conversation about? Just sort of reflect on the conversation. <laughs>
again, it would be nice if you let that, that go on, but unfortunately we don't have enough time. Um, so that's just something to sort of get into the topic, to get into the area of the dialogue. We're going to work with a short extract from uh, Jacques Bellot's book, Familiar Dialogues, and um, it's set in a butcher's shop or in a poulterer's shop. Uh, so the poulterer says, what do you buy? And Ralph, the customer, says, show me a couple of good and fat rabbits. <laughs> to which the poulterer replies, here be them. Can you see if I stand here, by the way? Um, here be them that be very good and fat. <laughs> Ralph replies, they be very stale. <laughs> Truly, they be very new. How sell you them? How much? Ten pence the couple. It is too much. You are too dear. They be not worth so much. They be worth but a groat. Okay. Now, I live in Devon, and uh, in many ways, there's a lot, a lot of kind of similarities there. I, I find myself almost putting on a Devon accent when I, when I, when I do the, this dialogue. Um, okay, so the next stage is, I'd like you to work with the person next to you. Um, could you just try out the dialogue now? So one of you is the poulterer, and one of you is Ralph. Just sort of perform the dialogue. <laughs> take this a step further and I'd like you to try to actually memorize this dialogue. Oh. So I'd like you to try and keep it in your head. And in a minute I'll take it away and we'll see if you can sort of do it without the mic. So you know, in, ever, in whichever way you feel it's most appropriate, try and memorize it. But um, I'd just like you to experience trying it out anyway. So could you, could you just try now without the script? Just try it. An improviser from music.
um, now we we could we could obviously get get somebody to perform that. Um, but we're, we're slightly pressed for time now. I'd like to just move on now. What is going to help? What helps in memorising these kind of dialogues? What are the things that are going to help us or help our learners to memorise dialogue if we believe that it's a useful thing to do? Um, now, many of the techniques which actors use in memorising dialogue will be something which we can bring into the language classroom. So, sensory channels. The more senses that are involved in accessing the dialogue, the more easy it will be to remember. So, um, you know, some actors write out the lines again. Um, reading the lines will help. Looking at vi there's a visual element there, just reading and looking at them, writing them out. Um, also, actually saying the lines will help. Personalization. The more that we can feel we identify with the character, then the easier it will be to remember. Some of you, when you were doing those dialogues, incorporated gesture and physicalization naturally into it. Um, you know, there was a lot of <laughs> here be them, the rabbits, or, or you know, a lot of a lot of movements like that. Uh, noise and noise. By the way, all these there is a handout that goes with this session, and all the references that I mention are mentioned on there. Um, noise and noise did a very interesting study, um, 2006, I think it was, which looked at the area of physicalization and learning lines by actors, and they found that when actors tried to learn their lines using a movement or a gesture, it was much easier for them to recall it later. And interestingly, they didn't actually have to do the physical movement at the moment of recall. So the physicalization actually just helped with the initial contact with the line. Emotional investment. Um, if, we, if we feel the uh, annoyance of the poulterer at somebody telling him his rabbits are stale, if we can sort of get behind that feeling, we're going to find it easier to remember the dialogue. Um, actors talk about breaking text down into beats. So each, there might be a particular part of the text, part of the dialogue, which has a particular emotion. So breaking that text down into emotional uh, chunks will be a, a useful strategy. Cues. We often remember our lines because of making a strong link with the line that went before. And, um, you know, I mean, I think a lot of accomplished actors, that is what they do. They're not thinking about what their line is. Michael Caine says something interesting about how he, he takes the line off the other actor's face. So he's looking at the other actor's face and he's, he knows you know, there's some kind of stimulus there that's telling him what his next line is. Um, actually using prompts. I mean, a lot of theatres don't use a prompt and they expect the actor to sort of improvise their way out of a, a situation. But in the language learning class, um, a language class, I, I think a prompt is actually quite a useful thing sometimes to have somebody who's not involved in the dialogue who can give you a little bit of the line and, and that can serve as a memory trigger to help you remember. And also testing, self-testing, testing yourself constantly on the dialogue. So not thinking that you've learnt it, but actually trying to remember it. I mean, one of the things I often do when I'm learning lines for a play is just work, cover up the script and sort of move the piece of paper down so I'm constantly testing myself on what's the next line. Yeah? Okay, now, maybe we should also address this question. Is this a useful thing to do in the language class? Is practicing, memorizing, performing, dialogue, sketches, plays, is it a useful language learning activity? Um, in many contexts, it has been almost frowned upon because of its sort of links with behaviorism. 
It's a behavioristic thing to do. We're telling people what to say. They're not really thinking of the language. They're, they're, in a way, it's non-communicative. You're, you're, you're giving people lines and you're making them say them. Yeah? Um, I think that recently two things have happened which um, two sort of recent developments in language teaching, in, in language teaching methodology, uh, have a, a, a very strong bearing on this. One is the work of people like Michael Lewis um, implementing the lexical appro approach. Modern analyses of real data suggest that we are much less original in using language than we like to believe. Much of what we say consists of prefabricated multi-word items. So the dialogue, the sketch, the play is a fantastic um, context in which to present chunks of language. And we don't need to necessarily understand the grammar behind those chunks in order to use them. So we can, we can perform a play, um, we, can, we, can use a, a, we can learn the lines of a script using the present perfect where, where we're not even completely sure how the present perfect works. But um, you know, some linguists would suggest that, in fact, that's how we learn the grammar, by building up a repertoire of chunks of language com containing that language item. So that's one, that's one quite strong argument for using uh, pre-scripted work. Um, another is this, I mean, people say we're in the post-communicative language teaching era now. And a very strong critic of the communicative approach um, has been Guy Cook in his book um, Language Play, Language Learning, where he says, you know, we've gone too far with this idea that everything has to be meaningful, everything has to be uh, real language use, everything has to be, uh, you know, to communicate an idea. And he emphasizes very much the idea of language play, the idea of ritualistic language use. Um, and the fact that, in fact, what is memorable to students is not always the mundane and the meaningful. Sometimes the bizarre, the silly, the ritualistic is, is also what we remember. I'm always struck by, when I work with teachers um, of English from other countries, I'm always struck by how many um, odd nursery rhymes that they know, that they, me they remember in English, or you know, songs or unusual bits of literature that they just know, and sometimes those are quite meaningless. So, um, you know, I think this is another argument for using a play-based approach, that language, you know, we, we can use text which doesn't necessarily fit in with the student's world, but they may find it memorable anyway. Yeah. Now, um, I would like to just show you a very quick extract of some students doing a dialogue. Now, um, one thing I have done with students is get them to work over a long period of time on a play, and I think that's a fantastic thing to do. I mean, I recently met up with a group of students in Birmingham where we performed a play, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago, and we met up sort of five years later and watched the video of the play. And it was a very power I think it was a very powerful experience for everyone who was involved in that play. Um, so there are a lot of other things going on when we do do a play with students other than the linguistic things of learning the lines. <coughs> students have sometimes said to me how useful it is to receive feedback on the way they're performing a play. So they're, they're working on lines and you know, just having that feedback on the way that they're doing things is a very useful tool. I mean, just to show you what um, Guy Cook says about this. The rehearsal and performance in an appropriate play combines the best of both structural and communicative syllabuses. Rote learning and repetition of a model, attention to exact wording, practice in all four skills, motivating and authentic language and activity, instances of culturally and contextually appropriate pragmatic use and integration of linguistic with paralinguistic communication. So putting on a play can be a very powerful experience for language learners. We don't always have time to do that. We don't always have um, the possibility to do that in the context in which we work. But I think just the idea of 
giving students a dialogue to practice, to memorize, and then to perform over a short period of time is also a useful thing to do. So I'd like to show you um, a short dialogue. Now, this dialogue is from Ken Wilson's book, which is called Drama and Improvisation, and it's an excellent book. Um, if he isn't going to plug it in his session, I'm going to plug it in mine. And it contains, at the back of the book, there are a, a range of short dialogues um, th th which, which are in English and are suitable for a range of different levels, and I would guess that they could be adapted for different languages. Yeah? Also, on your blog, you have a, a range of um, dialogues as well and scripts, don't you? Will you give the address of that in your...? I will. Great. Okay, now I'd like to... Now, how do I get out of this? Oh, um, eh, okay. Now, so I'm going to show you this YouTube dialogue. Now, this is two, this is two primary <coughs> teachers of English who came on a course in Devon. Their level is not that high in English, um, but they are because they've suddenly sort of been thrown into the situation of having to teach English. They're in a primary school, they're, they're not trained as English teachers, they're trained as primary teachers, and they're suddenly having to teach English. And this is happening in lots of countries all over Europe. So what's happened here is they've learnt a very short dialogue. Basically what I did was I gave them the sketch, and they kind of memorised it at home, and then we spent a little bit of time in class... Um, practicing it and give, giving each other feedback on their performance and then they performed and other people watched. So just have a look at the dialogue. I hope the sound, the sound is on, is it? Yeah, great. So, but we can, um, uh, you know, we can have some very flat and meaningless reading of the text. So I wanted you to experience some of the, the situation before doing it. Yeah. I mean, that happens. I think that happens as a natural process. I mean, it happened here. I don't think that was exactly the dialogue that we started with. So, I mean, yeah, we, we, I don't think we should be too strict about, you know, this is the fact you've got to get it exactly right. I mean, the thing is, I don't think that learners will immediately acquire the language. If the language is different from the level that they have, they're not going to immediately acquire it. But I do think it has a slow release effect. If we memorize something, it has a slow release effect on our language. I had a very, very interesting experience where I found the script of a play that I performed in Denmark about 20 years ago. And I found the script again. Somebody sent me the script, and it was amazing how it came back to me. Looking back through the script. And I could, I could literally remember the movements that we had with certain scenes. I could remember, oh, that was when I moved over and went like that, you know, or, I mean, it's, 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 it may have a very slow release. I think, I think we, we should leave it there because we're already a little bit over time. So um, perhaps if there are any other questions, maybe you, you could ask them afterwards. Okay, thank you very much.